is uh, yeah, WebEx has an interface uh, with, I think, dark mode. So it's the old black background. Uh, I got a new update. Uh, so today we are going to continue talking about biological networks. Um, last time uh, we were talking about how to represent these networks in memory uh, in the data structure. And I mentioned an adjacency matrix representation. I'm going to talk more about this when we talk about uh, biological network analysis. Uh, but uh, today I'm going to also uh, going to go over, uh, because it was a bit of a rush at the end of the last lecture, uh, I will go over the details of how we can have these hash table of hash tables or map of maps type of representation to access uh, node vertex vertices by names, by strings, uh, instead of indices. Uh, but the main idea basically is the same as an adjacency list representation. So if you uh, take a look at a data structures book and, or an algorithms book where uh, graphs are studied, if you read more about how we can uh, solve problems using graph representation, uh, you're going to come up with this adjacency matrix representation and adjacency list representation and the uh, hash table of hash tables that I uh, have in my code is uh, an adjacency list implementation of graphs. So I'm going to come back to that uh, later, but let's first quickly uh, finish the first set of slides. Uh, it has lots of biological motivation for analysis of uh, for biological networks. So I'm going to uh, quickly skim through some of these biological motivations. It's a long set of, uh, it's like 57 slides here, but um, I want to quickly get to uh, this analysis of biological networks part, which is, which I'm more interested in. And I'm going to talk about clustering and random walks on graphs. So I'm going to talk about methods, how when we read those graphs in memory, how we can analyze them uh, by right by implementing these methods on them is uh, the part that I'm more, in, more interested in. But there's also some computational interesting uh, problems uh, about networks that are uh, mentioned in these slides too. So I'm going to quickly go over these slides, but if you have any, qu have any questions when I'm going over them, please let me know. All right, by the way, I'm recording, okay. So, uh, the, whole, the interactome, this term interactome, refers to the set of all interactions between uh, proteins or of an organism. Or uh, So the interaction network is just like genome. We have the genome, which is the whole collection of genes of an organism. Proteome, which is dynamic, which is the set of proteins that are currently in the cell. That's the proteome. There's the transcriptome. Uh, which is the set of uh, genes that are transcribed currently in the set. So proteome and um, the transcriptome are dynamic entities. What are transcribed in the cell change, changes from state to state. Genome, on the other hand, is fairly constant uh, unless we have different mutations or different copying errors uh, in our genome. Our genome is fairly constant through our, our different tissues, different cells. And interactome also is something dynamic, actually. Uh, when we say this protein or this gene interacts with this gene, uh, and we usually have these interactome represented as graphs. And when we see the entire interactome, it's like the genome, it's something static. But what really goes on in the cell is that the interactome itself is also dynamic. These interactions, some of them are stable, some of them are transient, they uh, interact and go. Uh, and in certain situations, again, the, the interactome may be situation dependent. Some of these proteins may not be expressed in the cell at all. So com combined with transcriptomics or proteomics data, we can have a subgraph, a subset of these uh, vertices realized being uh, realized in that cell, uh, which in, uh, in turn makes the interactome itself dynamic. All right. But many analysis and the, the, the clustering or, or, and the random walk analysis we're going to conduct on these networks, they assume that we are given a static fixed interactome and we try to figure out, for example, molecular complexes by analyzing these graphs and finding clusters. So that was how the initial 
uh, interactons were analyzed. But getting this data was the difficult thing in the first place. In, in the beginning of 2000s, for example, there were studies about how to predict which protein interact with which one. We had co-expression networks like string database. We have physical interaction networks. Uh, I talked about this a little bit. Why we can, There are experimental protocols to determine whether two proteins physically interact or not, whether this interaction is uh, stable, like whether they form a complex, identifying molecular complexes. There's a, a database, uh, I think it was the MIPS database. MIPS yeast interactions database. Oh, they, they updated to MIPS mammalian protein protein interaction database. There's also, yeah, there's protein interactions resource on these impact. So as you can see, these are in 2000s, 2005, 2006, the interaction resource on yeast, MIPS, a database of protein sequences. It, it actually started in 1997. Uh, so finding the interactions in the first place was difficult. And as you can see, in these years, we have these large portals like Pathway Commons database, which collect data from literature uh, by the collecting uh, information from low throughput studies that show interaction between two specific proteins or a group of proteins. And uh, after we have those, uh, the analysis of these, as I said, these days, people are now, uh, the new current research is dealing about the dynamicity of interactomes for example there are networks that are tissue specific there are interactomes that are tissue specific disease specific for example if you if somebody's somebody gives you the blueprint of the entire cell and it tells you that these uh, proteins are ex currently in the cell synthesizing the cell or these mess transcripts are transcribed in the cell <clears throat> how what uh, how can you compare that interactome with another interactome with a different state. You can compare, for example, uh, the interactome of a normal healthy person with a person with a disease to identify which biological pathways are disrupted due to these differences. So this is what uh, the current research is dealing with these days, different differences between interactomes, alignment of grab the networks of different organisms. If we have the blueprint of a uh, uh, model organism like mouse. Uh, and if you conduct experiments on mouse, mice, for example, uh, how does that blueprint of mice overlap with the human interactome? Finding uh, biological processes, uh, their similarities, differences by trying to align these entire graphs. So these are the challenges people uh, deal with these days usually. But uh, uh, here, this was, uh, the, I will now quickly go over gene regulator networks, which is about how transcription factors, these are directed interactions that we had on our uh, graph, uh, the pathway commons graph. For example, exp uh, edges of this type, controls expression of, are exactly about this such kind of a gene regulator. Uh, they are the edges of gene regulator networks. Uh, A1BG is uh, probably a transcription factor mm, or maybe it controls the expression of A2M uh, indirectly by phosphorylating something which may be a transcription factor. Okay, so for example, AKT1 may be the transcription factor here by controlling the phosphorylation of AKT1, A1BG may indirectly control affect the expression of A2M. So that may be the case. So there are some of these interactions we have here, uh, like control expression of maybe direct or indirect, okay? And uh, gene regulator networks are usually between directed interactions between transcription factors and their targets. So this was uh, the slides that you're going to see next of all the way until the end of the, uh, the slide set is uh, from Shalovitskovic's talk. Uh, he was a postdoc of Uriah Lons, uh, he was a member of the Uriah Long group in, back in 2005, so it's been 15 years now. But they were talking about how to analyze gene regulator network. And Uriah Long wrote a book on computational systems biology, focusing on gene regulatory networks. So the research 
uh, focuses on uh, these transcription factor target interactions and how certain modules, network motifs, they identify the term, uh, they introduce the term uh, network motif and how uh, nature actually is modular, how certain topological uh, small subnetworks with certain topologies are observed again and again in different parts of the network and how they have a specific biological function. So one of their biggest contribution was first showing, doing some kind of a graph analysis to find frequent uh, patterns that exist more than expected in these networks, okay? For example, if you just say a single edge is a pattern, it's what you expect in a random network of this size and this density will be probably exactly the same. I mean, they will not be considered a pattern. But if you consider a subnetwork of four or three uh, edges like this, and if there's a specific type of topology, a specific type of organization of edges between them, and if you count how many of the same topology exist elsewhere on the network, even if you count them, and if you count the same thing in a as an ensemble of random networks. I mean, this is the, for example, the real biological network. Uh, you, if you've tried to figure this out, for example, is this something that is expected or something that this is specific to this biological version of this network? So if you do the same count in random networks and see that this topological pattern has some biological significance, some statistical significance, which may imply biological significance, then you may go ahead and do additional experiments in the lab to identify what this network module is used for. And they, uh, they identified certain biological functions uh, related to these small topological motifs, and it was really remarkable. So the, in nature, for example, just like um, electrical circuits, we have gates, AND gate, OR gate, so we have these uh, small components of electrical circuits that are used over and over again. They identify different types of gates that nature has. Uh, some, something, uh, some of them are not binary, like Boolean, because there are thresholds that are involved too. There is an, a gate, for example, which is somewhere between OR gate and an AND gate. So I'm going to give an example of that, and that's really remarkable. That's the, the main purpose here is to motivate how the blueprint of the cell, how the organization of the proteins within the cell, interactions within them also has certain, uh, just like sequence motifs, uh, these are also conserved. The interactions, the relationships between them is also something that is conserved in nature. And uh, the, the, they use the E. coli as the model organism to have their experiments on. Uh, so E. coli is an organism uh, like this, a single cellular uh, organism. Uh, it is very one micron length and it contains 1000 protein types at any given moment. I think its genome is maybe uh, 2000 so, uh, or 10. So it, its genome size is larger than that, but it's selectively, although it's a single cellular organism, there is no different tissue type or anything. Even a single cellular organism have a, a way to for gene regulation. Not all the genes are transcribed at all the moments in E. coli. And this is something that is optimized to, I mean, evolutionary pressure optimizes organism to make this selection because making all the proteins to be ready for any situation uh, may seem like a good decision, but uh, making proteins has a cost. You're spending the amino acids uh, that are available to you in the cell. So you have to make a, 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 a cell uh, which has a, a decision mechanism, which produces proteins as they are needed, uh, is going to uh, favor better in evolutionary, under evolutionary pressure uh, compared to cells which produce everything regardless of the situation. Okay, so we are going to see that uh, even a simple, single organism like E. coli has an amazing technology. Just like uh, it's, the, its blueprint, uh, it has an engine, uh, like these are flagella, uh, which uh, gives E. coli mobility. So it may move towards food or it may move away from toxins. And there is a decision mechanism built intrinsically with these uh, uh, with these interactions between 
uh, genes. And it's really interesting how uh, nature, I mean, this, uh, when I was looking for YouTube example videos, uh, how uh, and understanding this mechanism, the same organism and the complexity of this uh, is used by some intelligent design supporters to say that oh okay evolution does not exist this is this has to be some kind of an intelligent design but evolution also explains the same thing so it's really interesting how complexities can be interpreted differently by different people saying that okay this has to be some design but you'll see that the interactions between them the network motifs between them governs actually how this this happens and it may well be uh, explained by evolution as well okay so depending on your uh, worldview uh, you can uh, use the e coli to support your claims but uh, as i said nothing in molecular biology makes sense uh, without the light of evolution so uh, i believe uh, personally but uh, here my main purpose in this course is to show you the complexity of this blueprint it's really like a computer okay so it has sensors there are it has ports a communication bus within the cell that gets the signal into uh, the nucleus I, th I think it's a eukaryote uh, so there is it has a nucleus so an interesting thing is that it can move towards food and away from toxins and the interesting thing is that these flagella these uh, flagella are they are proteins the its motor is also a protein uh, a, a, a huge molecular complex they are synthesized only when there is need for motility so if, if, if it wants to move so all these this is from like keg pathway database i think yeah this flagellar assembly uh, which proteins are involved in which parts of this flagella and it's composed of 12 types of proteins so 12 subunits and this is interesting assembled only when there is an environmental need for motility otherwise it doesn't if it doesn't need to move doesn't make these proteins so if there's an and they're built in efficient and precise temporal order so they analyze all different things about e coli their research group i'm going to focus on only one aspect of it is energy metabolism how it chooses between glucose and lactose as it's as they're available within the environment so we're just going to look at one uh, type of uh, network motif or one type of uh, uh, top topology that is reused over and over again within this so i'm going to skip this part i already, we already mentioned about gene regulation when we talked about transcriptomics uh, so there are transcription factors uh, special proteins uh, and there are look at this edge this tells you that uh, in order for this protein to be uh, in order for this mes first messenger rna is transcribed in order for this messenger rna to be transcribed from the coding region of the dna uh, this transcription there has to be a certain condition that has to hold first this protein has to bind here that's an inducer and this protein does not should not bind here so when the protein is here the green protein it uh, prevents transcription okay so uh, so therefore we have different types of edges one transcription factor when it binds there it's, it acts like a repressor when it is here it's not transcribed it has so it's like a if condition which says that if this protein and not this protein then synthesize this uh, or transcribe this a messenger rna so there are different uh, activator induces it increases the activation it's shown as an edge like this uh, repressor decreased gene production when it is bound it decreases and none of these things are binary there's always threshold, the amount of transcription. It's not, unlike computers, the signals that or uh, that follow in, inside the cell, they are not Boolean. They are not zeros and ones. And probably it's everything is because spatial, spatial, uh, I mean, the, the space, the 3D space, uh, there's probabilistic things that are also going on here. So thresholds, uh, having certain protein with a, with a certain quantity increases that probability of binding and that's why we have there these thresholds probably so when the repressor is unbound we have increased transcription now 
here if you put all these transcription factors and their targets so it's like a layered network on the genome you have the genes you have the transcription factors here which are uh, interacting with the dna and inducing or repressing transcription of uh, different genes and these in turn transcription factors in turn are affected by environmental signals and, and this signal is propagated to this trans transcription factor as a sequence of as a cascade of uh, interactions therefore these are called signaling cascades uh, but if you put all of them together it will be a gene regulator signaling networks gene regulator networks you may call whatever uh, you have but th what the they did was or Elon's group did was they tried to have the the interactions between the transcription factors and their targets for all e coli proteins so in the end they had they analyzed they looked at the network did some topological analysis on them and also because of the promoter region uh, size restriction a gene cannot be uh, activated or repressed by many proteins there's it only has a certain space that can fit in so the in degree usually uh, so in degree means proteins that affect production of x that is uh, low and it may affect any x can itself may be a transcription factor and it may be affected by other transcription factors too but a, a single transcription factor may activate many genes okay so we have, we have seen on the order of 300 400 it's possible but it may it's affected by a few so this the, the general uh, degree distribution of uh, nodes are like this it's, there's an asymmetric degree distribution low in degree and high out degree the outgoing edges are the number of outgoing edges is called the out degree of a node and the number of incoming edges is the in degree of a node now what logical function if we have all these nodes and uh, all of the e coli so do they have some not logical but maybe biological function do they have a biological function and here they looked at the for an example energy source utilization so how e coli decides on whether it's going to glucose or lactose so uh, when there is no so this slide shows that this is this is lactose this is glucose it can use both of them so the energy production in e coli uh, could be uh, due to glucose or lactose and it prefers glucose uh, probably it's cheaper to the it's, its metabolic pathway and as you can see this gene regulator network is not independent from the metabolic network which has the how this glycolysis and how this lactose is turned into energy within the cell but uh, for lactose to be used a special enzyme so this LACZ is a, a protein I mean it's a gene that uh, produces uh, the black protein the enzyme which helps in metabolizing lactose so if there isn't lactose in the environment LACZ needs to be produced to uh, get energy and if there's so it's like an, if there's no glucose and lactose we can use uh, we have to the cell needs to decide on producing the lax z protein okay so how does the e coli decide to create this protein it seems like a simple if condition right if not glucose and lactose then la produce lax z it has to be something like that but it's not actually like that the cell has a really interesting decision mechanism which is not binary here we are going to see so it has actually uh, and uh, here uh, proteins i already told you that proteins have a cost not making the decision if an e coli organism decides i have to make all types of proteins so why not have lax z all the time uh, in case we need it so like the uh, worker ant uh, which works a lot to prepare for the winter so why don't we prepare for the case where no glucose and lactose this preparation is costly i mean uh, therefore uh, you have to spend some cost if you're just going to produce every protein it will cost you a thing and these the such e coli is going they're going to this cost is going to reflect on them as a slow slower growth and this even one over 1000 slower growth is enough for evolutionary pressure the other E. coli which can make this decision is going to uh, 
be fitter uh, compared to the other. So here's an AND gate that we would have uh, in electrical circuits. So this is our if statement. AND gates in electrical circuits, uh, when, and when they're uh, put in an electrochemical uh, schema, they are uh, represented like this. This is the logo or uh, I mean this is the shape that is used usually when uh, they built these electrical circuit uh, graphs and here our AND gate says that if there is lactose and not glucose then produce lactose. so this the end said here is a, maybe a signal that tells us at the end of this wire there's a signal that says okay make lactose now okay now, um, it's controlled by, there are two sensory proteins that actually controls this. There is this green protein. When there is lactose in the environment, it unbinds, okay? So uh, when it unbinds, we can produce lactose. So when there is lactose, so it, it's for this part. So when there is lactose, it unbinds, therefore lactose can be produced. And there's a glucose absence sensor. When there is no glucose in the environment, it binds here. Okay, so this is really like an, uh, when this binds and this unbinds, we have this nice AND gate. So these two sensors uh, from for the cell, uh, are, and these are these like so these sensors were identified in Journal of Molecular Biology in 1961. Okay, before we have, I mean, uh, the whole genome. So the E. coli, we, we have sequencing technologies now. Uh, biologists are really. Uh, creative people uh, that perform really nice interesting experiments and one of them is how can we how are we going to measure for example if in an e coli there is lax z or not how can we measure so there are different techniques to do that for example you can use proteomics to uh, with mass spectrometry you can use mass spectrometry to determine whether lax z or you can tag them there is tagging methods and one of a similar, uh, this can be also considered as a tag tagging method is called uh, using a reporter like a different protein than uh, LAGZ. In terms of coding, it's, it looks like this. So LAGZ is a specific function your program is going to call if it's some, something like this. Let me write it as a, as a Java code here. Okay, if... Uh, lactose these are coming from my sensor and not glucose then call this function call the lag z function in terms of code it looks like this okay now but imagine in that lag z function there is no printf statement uh, when the lag z function is called you won't be able to know that it's, it's difficult to measure whether the function is called or not. Okay, now what we do is we copy this part entirely. What if I copy this entire part and put here and say print something? Hey, Laxi is produced. Okay. So look at this. So we don't have printf uh, in Java, but anyway, you get the idea. So what I just did was I copied the exact same condition and put it in front of something else, which, which, is, which doesn't pr uh, produce laxity, but reports something to the outside world. And this is exactly, I mean, molecular biologists, uh, sometimes they uh, feel like they're uh, not programmers, but they're really, they're, they're programming the nature they are programming life so what they can do in their labs is that they can get this they can do copy and paste it uh, very efficiently they can copy this if condition and put it in front of something else and what what is this printf code they have here they're called reporter genes like this gfp it's called this green it's called green fluorescent protein what it does is if it's produced uh, everything becomes green uh, fluorescent so the cells light up so it's basically your printf statement uh, in, in these uh, petri dish so and this is what uh, how, what is that if condition then it's the promoter region the promoter region of LAGZ is copied and pasted in front of GFP and it's inserted into this bacteria so I think yeah it's uh, 
E. coli is not uh, eukary is a prokaryote. I, I'm not sure. I, I'm better at these things. But 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 you can insert this directly into its circular genome. So, but the good thing is that so we have added a new printf statement into the code of E. coli. Now we put it into this uh, modified E. coli with these printf statements into this, and we create ourselves this nice matrix lactose increase lactose so you, in those petri dish you have the e coli culture and you can give different lactose glucose amounts so this becomes your xy scatter plot in which low glucose high lactose uh, sorry, sorry low lactose high lactose in this axis and you can have low glucose high glucose amounts in this axis so what would you expect if that end gate worked as expected. If the end gate worked as expected, what we would expect is that in the absence of glucose and lactose, we will have laxy, right? So we want this part to be very greenish if it was an end gate. And all the other parts are not so greenish. Okay? If it was an end gate, it will be green in uh, I mean if you just think about this as a Boolean by dividing this in the middle. Uh, this uh, corresponds to that if condition. So there are four possible cases. Uh, no lactose, no glucose. No, no reason to make laxy. Glucose and no lactose. Again, no reason to make laxy. Glucose and no lactose. Gl glucose, when there is glucose, I will prefer glucose. There is no reason to make laxy. So we would expect something like this. Zero, zero, zero here. Some peak that is here. So let's see how it turned out. If it was an end gate, it will be like this. So, but here is what they observed. Uh, so this is shown in a different uh, orientation, but uh, this part here is the interesting part. This part is very like, very much like uh, these two parts that I said, no lactose, but this part is really, it's a halfway between. We don't have something like this in uh, Boolean algebra. We have all truths, truth, uh, zeros or ones. We don't have something 0.5. But in, in nature, the lactose production was 0.5. It was half. So it's like uh, this statement is executed half, not fully. Uh, so the, if, if, what, what this shows is that if there's lactose in the environment and glucose in the environment, it was this corner. So this corner, I also said when there's glucose in the environment, it prefers glucose. There's no need to make lactose. But if there's lactose in the environment and also glucose in the environment, Lactose is produced in half production. Okay, so it may still make use of lactose. Since there's lactose in the environment, why not use it? But if there's no glucose in the environment, this is that corner, no glucose and lactose, it goes into full production. So this is a different kind of a logical gate that we see here. And one thing very really interesting. So you think that, oh, this is something, a really intelligent mechanism. A really nice intelligent gate. So what they did what next was really interesting. They made simple single mutation changes in the promoter region. For example, this middle G is changed to a middle T. What do you get here? You get the perfect end gate. So in evolution with a single uh, mutation, if this T was changed into a G, you get your lack z gate this is an end gate and this is an or gate which we would not want that much so single mutations in the promoter region causes this lack z gate behave differently which shows you that the, the things that we see wow that that's a really smart thing e coli does does this half production it's a simple change of from g to t gives you this i mean for it was change from t to g gives you this from, you evolve from a regular end gate into a lag Z gate, okay? So I think this was a, a very nice experiment that they did by uh, showing these uh, mutations, providing different changes. And also the input function is optimally tuned to the environment. There are different motifs that we see. There is some, uh, when they looked at this entire E. coli network with a very fairly small number of nodes, and edges, and there are some self edges, so certain things may regulate themselves too. Transcription factors may regulate themselves too. 
it's called auto regulation and it was uh, it was actually a recurring pattern with a defined function so they counted how many different ways of interaction they observe in this entire e coli network and they figured out different motifs network motifs and they they also identified they all have certain uh, function biological function uh, so a network motif is a sub graph a small subset of nodes which occur significantly more compared the, than expected so we have some random networks which are not real biological networks but these suitable it's uh, highlighted in red because we cannot really have completely random network for example uh, having a transcription regulation network a gene regulator network in which uh, the same every node has the same in degree and out degree but they are randomly connected to different ones so we shuffle the network to get it to a non-real e. coli network to make it a random network and we count the same topological pattern in those if the topological pattern that we count is significantly more in the real e. coli network than what we would expect in the random one it means there's something biological going on here it has a statistical significance so here are some different types of networks a three node subgraph a four node subgraph which contains four uh, which involves four genes in it okay so here are some example three node graphs x uh, regulates y y regulates z x also regulates z so z is regulated both by both x and y but x also regulates y directly this is called the feed forward loop and it has some biological function uh, there is three node feedback loop there are feedback loops that we observe here these are all the possible uh, three node connected subgraphs that you could have uh, and there are 13 of them when you get the four it increases immediately to 199 and it grows pretty fast for five there are about 10,000 five node subgraphs and there are uh, 1.5 million different six node graphs so counting them in a large network uh, is uh, another research area but uh, there are many different methods already published uh, that can count these network motifs in large graphs efficiently okay so here's an example of a significant uh, network motif so in real network we count this feed forward loop so this is a feed forward loop we count the feed forward loop in this real network we find that it occurs five different places and we look at the randomized network how many times we, we just shuffle the edges or we just create some randomized networks we count how many of them have this feed forward loop two of them has two of them does not have it so the the average is like 0 0.5 with a standard deviation of 0 0.6 we can compute the z-score so if this is our null distribution so our null hypothesis is that this pattern is not significant if it's not significant you would expect it to be uh, a count of 0 0.5 because in the null distribution in the random networks it occurs 0 0.5 times so how different is the real count from the uh, real network we can find uh, with uh, let me write it here we can compute the z-score uh, by how, computing how many standard deviations it is away from that one it's, so it's going to be 5 minus 0 0.5 okay I couldn't write 0 0.5 divided by 0 0.6 so it's this many standard deviations away I mean I don't know whether it's 7.5 or not so you, you have to divide 4.5 by 0 0.6 let's see 4.5 divided by 0 0.6 yeah it gives you 7.5 now so that's your z-score uh, to find network motifs they had this algorithm they just count them count all possible ones count all n node connected subgraph in the real network and then uh, they shuffle the networks and generate a certain number of random they first create their null distribution by creating these random networks and they do the counting on for all these network motifs and certain motifs with a high z-score maybe 
may have some biological significance as well. And they figured out some, some, so, uh, some of them, for example, feed forward loop was such uh, one. In real network, it appeared 40 times. And in the, uh, actually it, is, it should be 11, it's Z score is 11, there's a typo here. Okay, so this is 11 because 40 minus seven is 33 divided by three, it's 11. Okay, so it's, it is a really high uh, Z score. In the real network, it was observed a lot compared to the random networks. And they, uh, the feed forward loop, the coherent feed forward loop with all positive edges, it actually acts like a noise filter, a science sensitive noise filter. For, they figured out their biological function. This motif that exists in the cell, it's like this. If there's an extracellular signal, this input X, uh, and this is the final Z, maybe your final output that will perform some function. If X directly modify, if X directly regulated Z, what would happen was with just small input of X, we would just, uh, since X, if X directly affected z we would see the small spike so the noisy input of x will cause noisy output in in the final uh, z protein like like it does in uh, y because x directly regulates y but what happens if you look at the signal of y what happens is that in order for z to be produced both x and y should appear above certain threshold so with this small noisy amount of X signal, Y is Y does not is not produce high enough to press this threshold and affect Z. Therefore, we, we see that in the signal of Z, this this noise is removed. So it's like it acts like a noise filter. Okay, so it's this really remarkable. Uh, and they figured this out also that it, it acts like a, again by using the green fluorescent protein, they performed experiments on uh, different proteins. There is the incoherent feed forward loop in which uh, one of them uh, represses, Y represses Z. And what if you have a constant signal like this, uh, the output signal on Z uh, acts like a pulsar. It increases and decreases, increases and decreases. So you can get pulsar circuit. Uh, there are different types. I'm just going to skip uh, these. There are different biological uh, functions that these network motifs uh, play a role in and there is single input module i'm going to skip that part too and yeah i think that's that should be sufficient for today and here some interesting research problems maybe can you can there be larger network motifs three four uh, other than three four node five node network motifs that may be biologically significant so uh, that's maybe one uh, research direction I don't know whether this link still works or not, but uh, Uri Alon's, you can search for Uri Alon's group and they have an M finder, motif finder, to find such motifs and count them, uh, find significant ones in gene regulatory networks. Okay, so this uh, concludes my discussion on the motivation for biological network analysis. And we gave a case study, an example on gene regulatory networks. There are uh, now what I'm going to talk about in the last we have five minutes left, but we're going to continue with analysis of biological networks on Monday. And after Monday, we are going to uh, know these uh, methods, the clustering at these, or maybe uh, we may start talking about random walks too. And we will have a way of analyzing not gene regulatory networks, but other types of networks too. And one of those uh, networks is this protein protein interaction networks, uh, in which uh, protein complexes may appear as dense communities, as communities in these large networks. Uh, so in order to perform, uh, in order to find these communities, uh, we have to perform graph clustering. And in certain graph analysis, we may want to figure out, okay, I have this set of proteins um, that are phosphorylated, for example, and I want to figure out what other proteins may be in the same biological process. You may want to look, look out at neighborhood, uh, just like uh, uh, 
Netflix, for example, recommends you if you have watched these movies, the next mo you should watch this next movie too. Just like that, for example, if you know a certain proteins in the network, oh, you should take a look at that protein too. Uh, it may have some biological significance. Uh, we may do that with the help of random walks. If we have a connection of these uh, networks, uh, one after another, and uh, I mean genes uh, that are tied to each other, uh, by with the help of random walks, uh, we may find uh, another protein that is closely, tightly connected to the genes uh, that we have found out. So we are going to see uh, these two analysis techniques. Um, but before uh, starting on this uh, graph clustering problem, I'm going to quickly go over uh, this adjacency list representation of uh, these graphs. So if you're given a graph like this, uh, let's try to, for example, let's uh, analyze how many. This was a larger network which contained 8.6 million edges. So this was the uh, string network. I'm going to modify my code to be able to read uh, the string network. The only difference is that they are very similar. They are both edge lists. But if you look at these two networks, uh, here uh, the protein 1 and protein 2 is in the first and third columns of a line. And in the middle, we have some type of an edge, type of an interaction. Here, on the other hand, we have a weighted network. Uh, you may or may not ignore, if you want, you may ignore these scores or you may keep them. But the, the two proteins that we're interested uh, in are the first and second columns. And there's also a first row here that we need to skip, which, which is like column descriptions. So I'm going to, all I need to do is uh, skip the first line by having another read line here. This one skips skip the skip first line okay and here the other change i need to do is uh, just make this zero and one uh, the first two columns become the first two proteins i'm not sure whether this is tab or comma separated you, you uh, or tab, uh, tab or space separated it's here so this was tab separated i know but is this space separate? Is there a space between them or a tab between them? I'm not sure. Let's see. I think it's a space because I put tab. It, it's like this. Uh, it's space separated. So another thing we need to do is, uh, by the way, when you're using uh, these uh, string processing libraries, you don't need to worry about whether it's a. There's there are functions that are that split them into tokens but with any white space. But since I have my own split function that I implemented here, uh, which gets the white space character explicitly, I have to, instead of, if I, if, if I split the line with tabs, it's just, since there are no tabs in that line, it's just going to be a single token. So I, I have to also indicate it's space uh, separated. So let's try to look at the string graph and what it's uh, going to how many nodes, how many proteins are there in that? And I'm going to continue again. Uh, this analysis of this code again came to the end of the lecture. Unfortunately, I'm going to continue. You will have plenty of time on Monday. I will start with this talking about this read network.java on uh, Monday and we will uh, talk more about this. But I just want to sh show you uh, the this. Oh, sorry, read network. And this was, yeah, this is the large string file. And it's reading all 8.6 million edges one by one. It's, it, remember, it was a th uh, something like more than 300 megabytes of text file. So it's reading and creating our graph in memory, uh, which contains all the interactions between uh, the all the edges here that are given to us, okay, all these edges that are given to us will be put into an adjacent list representation like this. And it finished doing this. Oh, there are a round number of 19,000 nodes in the network. Wow, the number of nodes in the network is fairly smaller than the ones uh, here, okay. 
but it was a large, much larger network. It shows that string network is a much denser network. The average degree in string network is probably much larger. Uh, by the way, this is 30,000, but it includes some chemicals, compounds too. That's, that may be one of the reasons it's larger. Uh, but with, uh, if you t look at the number of lines each, each of these network has, pathway commons, uh, there are 1.3 million edges in this one. And in the other one, it's about 8.6 million. Okay, 8.6 million edges. So it's a less number of nodes means that this is denser than the other network. So we will uh, talk about how we can, uh, for example, cluster, find communities, find strongly connected uh, groups of genes, proteins in these networks. Uh, because uh, even this 8.6 million, 8 million edges it's still a small number if you take the square of this it's 400 around 200 million so the the if it was a full graph there would be 200 million edges so out of those 200 million edges 8.6 of them are away uh, are present so it's 8.6 divided by 200 so it's only this the whole graph is like 4% full. So 96% of the graph is empty, it's sparse, okay? Uh, so even with 8.6 million edges. All right, so that's it from me for today. Uh, we will continue talking about these uh, analysis of graphs and I will go over this code and I'm going to share this code with you after we finish uh, next week, after we write some additional code on it. All right, uh, that's it from me for today. I will stop recording now.